can everybody hear me yeah all right good afternoon everyone my name is anindya ghoshroy i am an associate professor at the national brain research center it is my pleasure and honor to welcome all my friends colleagues students fellows and all the dignitaries and the guests in today's pub pub public lecture event uh, which is the major event uh, in today's 18th foundation day of nbrc 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 usually uh, fondly celebrates foundation day with multiple scientific events uh, including scientific lectures uh, open day for the school students and the college students unfortunately due to covid situation for last two years we are not having these activities but today we are very honored to have a very special guest professor padmanabhan balram uh, who has kindly agreed to give this public lecture uh, first i would like to request professor mandal our director in charge to say few uh, words about nbrc and the foundation day professor mandal thank you anindo for a nice introduction and introducing our beloved professor balaram that and it's a big honor for him he is there with us and giving a talk nothing can we have for which are less than 12 minutes so i i just want to give a quick talking to in a cool mind they came from different par different parts of the countries and also trained in various leading laboratories they left their research in left the country united states germany and in other countries developed countries and came to india came to india and nbrc joined to do the cutting edge research they are unique nobody is replaceable by another person so they are so unique so we just start to talk about their research activities of this so before we telling this one this is a matrices people talk about it that we we do in more research and that research is actually what type of research and how people see us or quality outcome in terms of citation so nbrc has a h index in 70 from google scholar so this is we have and then we have a program called psd and uh, msc program we are deemed university from 2002 and our accreditation process is already completed we have some news at the end of this lecture so so this is the different variability and we are continuing our research has been well cited in various cases and nbrc is very very unique in this sense we attract foreign funding we attract top funding agency in the country not only dbt dbt is like our mother but there are any other organizations they are actually give us for our various outcome measures and it has a various facilities unique for brain research like a state of the art nmr facility mri facility you make facilities um, two photon microscopy there are different other facilities available well. microscopes are unique in this cases they are unique for brain research and you can see the profiles of funding this year the because of the funding there was extra five amount was given to us 
and next year 5% increase because we are doing good from the DVT in the time of crunching. So it's a case of good satisfaction. Now we actually invite, we get money from different organizations. That's what we survive apart from government help. United States Air Force, NIH, Ministry of Youth Affairs, Electronics and Informs and Technology, so many other organizations. So this is our, our actually our own person. These are all students. They did so many, there are so many students, I cannot even tell you that they have actually, this is few of them pictures we got and some of them are collection stage. So they are, they are actually our pride as a teacher, as a faculty, they are our actually ambassador. So right now NBRC has given 96 PhD so far. So we are four sort of to get 100. That was my target in 2021. So here I talk about research component. Research component is that NBRC is like a family. All faculty members hang around together. They kind of discuss together and they build together about brain research, different aspect of it. So there are five sections in the there, but basically there is no section is open space. This is just a phase of neck activation. We have to do this kind of arrangement. So these are the one of the work. I'm just sharing all faculties work briefly, very briefly, because they're elaborating. This is that role of cortical interactions. Usually they are actually doing, looking at the what are the connectivities. And this work has been published in cerebral cortex, one of the prestigious journal. So this is this why they, it, it will take a little time for explaining, but these are available in this journal, several can be downloaded. Then another aspect is that what is our contribution for um, this COVID time research? Our scientists actually very much in leading role, like El Elora Sen has done some Asmadhus, one of, they actually protect us from this COVID. This is ancient time wise, it is there. And based on our research, original work, there is a clinical trial in Jammu. So you can see that we decide and other people actually, some of them <coughs> do the clinical trial. Then another work is in Pankaj said, he is actually looking at that COVID, we should not be looked at on the, the respiratory system. It has a lot, lot to, to damage at the brain. So he is looking at the biological aspect. So this is very important because people are very busy for looking at the pulmonary system. So another thing is that, <coughs> excuse me. So here we also, as a imaging, also another aspect of it, we said that we want to monitor the mental health by imaging. So that means some things who will be having a some uh, psychological problem, psychiatric problem, they can be monitored and we can predict it. That type of work has been done and has been highlighted. Now, another work of uh, Dr. Anirban, he's gone out of the way, see that that <clears throat> how monocycling can be effective for Japanese encephalitis. His original work was actually taken to the for a translational mode and there are clinical trial has been done and it was found it out the sample size need to be done in a more number of people so that it can be tested so that a lot of people's life can be saved because of his research. Now another possible aspect of it that we are collecting data from ourselves publishing it. But this data is unique. There is a big initiative called Sades has been generated. So this Sades actually is a unique proposal in the world where brain neurochemical data is available and that data can be out of being tested in patient and is arranged in the close collaboration with AIMS, Dr. Manjriti Party. So this is an original work available in the center, published data cited extensively and that has gone for clinical trial. So this is, you see, this data can be taken by other people and Honorable Minister three weeks ago actually inaugurated this center. He kindly visited along with our secretary, new secretary. So it is a matter of pride for us. Now, next one, next one. So this is, you see, not only we do the cutting edge fundamental research, we have also a clinical trial is coming up that antioxidant glutathione, whether it can seize the impairment of the MCI patient that is waiting for to start the process. Another also, our colleague has started Nivedita 
so she is going to do the parkinson disease related some hildopa levodopa how does it affect the parkinson disease patient so you can see two clinical trial already stand up waiting for to start after covid then there is a i showed you the pictures each one was telling that they are unique aninda is very interested to understand how neurons are polarized in initial stage of development and he he talks very simple but his goal is very high and his work has been <coughs> published in proceedings some national academy of science so it speaks for itself now sieb saw sieb good friend sieb is also looking at the memory for himself then he is actually integrating this cell and his interest in alzheimer disease how the memory how it can be uh, involved in a synaptic plasticity and memory so this has a serious implication in biological aspect of alzheimer disease research professor ranjit is another aspect he has brought which is actually is looking at that the um, stem this the understand molecular mechanism between amyloid beta peptide and prion replication so he is the only person working this national brain research center and prion research he is trained from nobel laureate group prushner he actually came from there and from this knowledge base so to translate a prion given new direction he has published lot of good papers and many more to come so here this is dr sorov at is very happy to tell you that his work in plus biology came as a front page that cover page and actually this is very very important for nbrc not from him also so this he has actually rna based mechanism of synapse formation synaptic plasticity and memory formation he has many papers actually in a top journals he's been lined up in a various stage of acceptance so it's a matter of he's a relatively new person and he's opening up in various great directions so this is somia so somia is unique is a very unique in the country she is actually trying to investigate the behavioral response to mirror and mark test in adult zebra finches and house crows so she is actually looking at how these animals behave and how their cortical connectivities are there so this is a another it takes about a day to explain her detailed work so this is very much important and we have lot of crows in this our nbrc center here is a bhavani this is very important bhavani is a new recruit and he has open up a new direction specialized vesicle trafficking pathway in neuron and neuro neurorecurrent cells and roles in diseases so he has started his lab in a very strong footing and i'm sure i'm sure he will have many more good publication and work will come out from him sick last one is the druva is <coughs> he is trying to understand the drosophila model for alzheimer disease very simple system but very complicated disease and he is setting up he is also one year he is here with us and he, many more things will be coming he has excellent model so he is working very hard in this direction to establish then apart from our research also we do lot of social work we help as india as our friend and many people come to nbrc our scientists go to the various organizations and various school college to brain awareness weeks and also we have our many many organizations are trying to have a collaborative um, mou with us tor institute university of pittsburgh and then other engineering institutes they are also trying to have a mou so that we can have a collaborative research also i want to emphasize that in the covid time we reach out to the civil hospital we help them with all support so many many people did their scanning time much faster than without our help so they are all like a part of our family we help them many ways they help us for vaccinating our student much before actually other people did so our student god grace there is no no casualty and and we are see although there are some cases where they all say we have a fantastic rmo he actually was living basically with them he saved us so i must be thankful to him for this we have a green canopy we are actually fill up the entire places with their trees and that that type of activities our students are very uh, very active they participate with our staff member and then we have a 
APJ Kalam Award to encourage our students so that they can do very well in publication and leave the institute in six year times and go to the various places to do very good work or they join somewhere else in India to enrich our country. So this is the slide I want to give it to you that I would like to say that thank you very much for all support we get from DBT. We have a, we have a new secretary, scientist, trained colleague. So that's a big thing, strength for us. We have a minister visited and he said in his writing that we'll come back again and spend an entire day with us. You are so pleased. And we have a, so many supporters, friends from other DBT institutes, they support, help us and DBT like to say with the humble things we tried hard work like a team and that's a very good news for us that nbrc was a university of in second from team to be university from 2002 then in the process we learned and then we start the process of accreditation Uh, which major audience today are the students and the faculty of NPRC. So it will be.
block different ion channels. So here is the angle of Professor Balram, which is connecting to the neuroscience research of our institute. Without further ado, I, I would like to invite Professor Balram to give his lecture titled Chemical Behavior and Neuroscience. Professor Balram, thank you. Anandio, can I share my screen? Yes, yes no? please, sir. Yes. We get something here. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Uh, sir, it's coming up. Coming up, sir. I'll, I'll try and make it full screen. Yes, I can yes. see now the screen here. We can see. Okay. Just wait for a second. I've made it full screen, so you should be able to see it full screen. Yeah, we can see it now. Okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, you know, before I begin, I must tell you that my internet connection is somewhat unstable today. So if my voice breaks, just be patient and I'll come back. No problem. Uh, when Dr. Mandel invited me to give this lecture at NBRC, I was a bit worried because I'm not a neuroscientist. And he said maybe I could talk about the role of chemistry in neuroscience. And I had given the title of Chemicals, Behavior, and Neuroscience. And in the email which I received this morning, I found that there was a typographical in which the letter S and the comma had been deleted. So it's what I would call a deletion mutation, which can affect phenotypes as in the case of the coronavirus. It happens when we leave out but when we convert plural into singular and leave out a comma, I show you a book. I made this slide just before this lecture. Very interesting book, which uses the phrase eats, shoots, and leaves. And there's a comma there. And you can think about it yourself. The punt that gets up and removes the comma. And you can see two completely different meanings once the punctuation is gone. But in beginning this lecture, since I am talking to an audience of neuroscientists, I'll begin with Francis Crick. He wrote a book called The Astonishing Hypothesis of 1994, in which he said, and I take this from his obituary, which appeared in Cell just after he had died in 2004, written by Robin Holiday. He says, Crick says, you, your joys and your sorrows, your sense of personal identity and free will are no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells. As Lewis Carroll's Alice might have phrased it, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. This hypothesis is so alien to most people who are alive today that it can truly be called astonishing. And he entitled his book, The Astonishing Hypothesis in 1904. Just later, the century was ending, the new century and the new millennium were beginning. He wrote this in the millennium issue of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. He said, neuroscientists should scan molecular biology for appropriate techniques, but most important, they should ask their molecular biology friends for new tools. They should tell them what their difficulties are and what they want to do. Once the word gets around that a certain type of problem exists, it is surprising how often someone has a bright idea of how to solve it. So don't be shy. Ask. After all, exactly how our brains work is of vital interest to us all. So why shilly-shally? 
just for the benefit of those of you who are here, because I also found this usage of Shri Chali strange. What it means is, why should you hesitate? Why should you be indecisive? Why should you be, why should you delay in asking for collaboration? The effect of chemicals on the brain has been known for a long time. The most dramatic example which I had seen when I was young was when LSD or lysergic acid diethylamide, a hallucinogenic drug, became popular among college students and university students in the United States. Lysergic acid itself is derived by the hydrolysis of a natural product called adbutamine, which is a product of a fungus which grows on rye. And you can see here where I've drawn the red line, if you break that bond, then you get lysergic acid. Albert Hoffman, in the late 1930s and in the early 1940s, working in Switzerland in a pharmaceutical company, made many, many derivatives of lysergic acid. And he made the diethylamine derivative, which is the diethylamide. And then by accident, I think he must have had a little bit on his fingers, he ingested it and he had strange feelings. He first thought it was because of the chloroform that he was using. Later on, he realized that it was from LSD, which he had discovered. Hoffman did an ex interesting experiment in 1943. He made a very, very small, low concentration of LSD solution and drank it. And after that, he described what he felt. And that was a remarkable description which you can find on the internet. I've given you one reference here. April 19th, 1943, he actually ingested LSD and then he asked his assistant to take him back, both of them riding bicycles in those days. During the Second World War, everybody rode bicycles, petrol was scarce. And when he rode the bicycles, he felt enormous sensations. He was not sure he would reach home and he had ingested an extremely small amount of LSD. So here was a chemical which had a remarkable effect on the brain. This article in Scientific American is the story of Bicycle Day, which is celebrated every year on the 19th of April. And in 2014, there was a major conference which Huffman attended. LSD apparently had no great effect on Huffman. He took other molecules like psilocin, which he discovered also. He lived to the age of 102. Not because of this chemical, but he just lived to the age of 102. Plants produce a number of chemicals. I show two of them here. They're what we call natural products. Caffeine on the right and morphine on the right. Coffee plant and the opium poppy. And we can ask a scientific question. Why do plants make these complex molecules? If we ask this question, we're really revisiting the chemistry of natural products. Now it turns out that molecules are made by microorganisms, they're made by plants, they're made by animals. In a biochemistry textbook, we classify them. We break them into primary metabolites and secondary metabolites. There is nothing secondary about secondary metabolites. This is because plants invest a huge amount of genetic and metabolic energy in producing these molecules, both plants and microorganisms. I found this definition of secondary metabolism many, many years ago, which says that it represents the splendid idiosyncratic diversity of nature, endowing different species with specific solutions to biological problems. We can now ask some questions. How many chemicals are produced in nature? This is what we will call chemical space. We can ask how many living organisms are there in nature? That would be biological space. We can ask how are these chemicals synthesized? This would be the biosynthesis, which requires genes, gene clusters, regulation, and enzymes. 
You might also ask a more biological question. Why are these chemicals necessary for the organism? What is the biological imperative? In that case, we get into the field of chemical ecology. And of course, last of all, we can ask how are the chemicals of one organism recognized by the target organism? This takes us to the subject of receptor proteins and cell energy or and information transduction uh, in cellular systems. On this slide, I show you one natural product which you're all familiar with. The component of red chili which gives it a pungent taste, capsaicin. Capsaicin is an important molecule you will see on the next slide. It's made by this complex biosynthetic pathway. Each arrow requires an enzyme. Each enzyme requires a gene. So the plant is investing an enormous amount of biochemical metabolic effect in trying to make this molecule. It's very useful for the plant itself. There are many other molecules like this. Look at capsaicin and look at curcumin, which you find in turmeric and which everybody in India knows about. You will see that the left hand side of these molecules look very similar. There's an aromatic ring, a phenol with another substituent. These are called, they are derived from the smaller molecule vanillin and they're called vanilloid type molecule. Why are these molecules important? Because it is these molecules which have permitted the two Nobel laureates this year for medicine and physiology David Julius and Adam Pakutian to actually establish the existence of the transient receptor potential on the so-called trip ions channels. And it turns out that these molecules, in order to actually identify the channels, the capsaicin molecule is what gives us the receptor which allows us to sense heat, and menthol is what is used in the receptor which allows us to sense cold. So sensory perception and signal transduction are very important for our everyday life. And since you're neuroscientists, I thought that I would take a kindergarten picture of what we teach children are the five senses. We teach them that the five senses are touch, sight, hearing, smell, and taste. That's on the left-hand side of this. on the receptor prostate with reactions. And on this, this next slide, I detail this a little bit, which responds to light. Toxin, which has a, which absorbs right in the middle of the visible spectrum, nanometers, which allow us to feel touch, and then you have more molecules which allow us to smell and also in the here in the in the here of course a slightly more complicated thing because you are really listening to auditory signals it turns out that in biology all organisms except human beings communicate exclusively by means of chemicals very little by means of sound and certainly not by means of language so much of our discussions of chemistry and biology could be discuss chemical communication in biology, chemical diversity in biology. Communication in biology can be between cells or between organisms. If they are between cells, the chemical effectors are called hormones. If they are through space, either through the air or through the soil or through water, they are then other molecules, pheromones that they are volatile, diverse chemicals which are non-volatile. Everything that you see around you in biology is the result of organisms communicating with one another by means of chemistry. This chemistry is sometimes complicated. Why am I emphasizing chemistry in an institute for brain research? I must tell you this, that the best definition of chemistry that I've seen is the one by the biochemist who won the Nobel Prize for discovering the enzyme DNA polymerase. 
as a contract, he probably fired the first shot of the biotechnology revolution. Kornberg called chemistry the lingua franca of the medical and biological sciences. So in fact, it is the underpinning of both biology and medicine. So it is important that one understands a little bit of chemistry. How does chemistry differ from biology? I don't think it really differs from it in any significant way. It differs from it only in length scales and in time scales and in the complexity of chemical interactions in biology. I have now put on this, even from the internet, I've given you the source, all the way from a carbon-carbon bond and ethane up to bacteria and erythrocyte. You can see that the coronavirus, which is now dominating our discourse, lies right in the middle, somewhere between a ribosome and the mitochondria. The importance of chemistry is summarized in this cartoon. You have this man solving a crossword puzzle. He asks a question to the lady sitting next to him. What's a nine letter word for biotechnology? The very clever lady, she immediately answers chemistry. And today, if you ask in what is the nine letter word for material science, I would once again say it is chemistry. Now, one of the difficulties with chemistry is this, that in order to learn chemistry, one needs to learn structures. And chemical structures are really the alphabets of chemistry. In some sense, chemistry is like mathematics. If you're not comfortable with symbols and equations, which are the alphabets of mathematics, you're uncomfortable with it. So in order to learn chemistry and to learn mathematics, you need to need a, learn a language first. But of course, chemistry is recognized by very important people. The prime minister, for example, said after the last general election, that chemistry defeated arithmetic in the 2019 polls. He was right, because he had an intuitive understanding of what was meant by the chemistry between people. We'll come back to that in a moment. But I'm going to tell you a story now. At the beginning of the pandemic, when we were locked down, I read an article. The article was entitled, and it was in the magazine, The New Yorker, and it said, does hurting make us human? It described the Scottish lady pictured on the bottom left of this slide, who because of a strange combination of genetic quirks, her neg negative emotional range was enormously limited. She had a near inability to feel unhappy, to feel awful, and she had an expansive capacity for positive emotion. I thought this would interest neuroscientists. So when something bad happens, a brain immediately searches for a way to ameliorate the situation. It does not dwell on unhappiness. But what was even more important was her unusual emotional composition also was accompanied by a complete insensitivity to physical pain. It was then investigated after the physicians had discovered a unique phenotype, she was investigated by a powerful group of human geneticists, and they discovered that she had a mutation. And the mutation really led to a defect in an enzyme. This is why I tell I emphasized enzymes at the beginning. Fatty acid amide hydrolase, which I've shown here. What does this enzyme do? It takes the molecule on the left, whose name, interestingly, is anandamide, and breaks it down into two components, arachidonic acid and ethanolamide. As I will show you in a little while, arachidonic acid is a product of lipid metabolism, and ethanolamine, of course, you all know, is a constituent of biological membranes and phosphatidylethanolamine. It's also a constituent of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine which is nothing but three methyl groups on the nitrogen and an acetyl group on thydrops. If you put these two chemicals together, you make anandamide. So anandamide is something which is probably made in the brain and it needs to be hydrolyzed. So this is her genetic defect. But now what I'm going to show you, I'm going to digress for a moment. 
I'm going to show you the long history of the chemical structure determination of the active constituent of marijuana and the understanding of its action on the brain. The story begins in 1838, when an Irishman in India, at that time we were under the British, investigated the medicinal uses of cannabis in India. Cannabis has been widely used, the cannabis plant extracts, hashish. And he began in 1838. It took all the way till the mid-1960s, 1964, for the structure determination of the active constituent. And from the 1960s to the 1990s, it was an understanding of what was the receptor in the brain and what was the endogenous molecule to be transitioned in our understanding of marijuana's effects from chemistry to molecular biology to cell biology. But our starting point, of course, was in human practice or in human cultures. Why is this important? Because today, of course, marijuana is again in the news. Uh, when important people are caught with hashish they, or marijuana, they are, of course, immediately arrested by the National Narcotics Bureau. But marijuana research has a very long history. As the most distinguished organic chemists of the first half of the 20th century, Roger Adams, summarized a lot of work that he did on marijuana in 1942. He was a very respectable scientist. He repeatedly risked his career and his position, both for his cannabis research and his political ideals, standing up to the forces of intolerance in a very paranoid age. Now it turns out that both intolerance and paranoia have never ever gone away from the time of Roger Adams. They keep surfacing. And it uh, turns out that some of the most distinguished organic chemists of their time of Adams on the left, Alexander Todd on the right. Alexander Todd is the man who won the Nobel Prize uh, for finding coenzyme A and so forth, and was also the PhD supervisor of Hargobind Purana, who was instrumental in introducing all the methods of nucleic acid synthesis and also in determining the genetic code. But the structure of the active principle of marijuana was worked out in Israel by the scientist who's pictured here, Raphael Meshulam. He published this paper in the Journal of the American Chemical Society in 1960. And then he said sometime later that the endocannabinoid system is very important. Almost all illnesses we have are linked to it in some way or another. And that is very strange. So he then began to do research, which was very, very important. He asked the question, how is a plant product now acting on the brain? There must be receptors for it in the brain. But evolution has not placed receptors for tetrahydrocannabinol in the brain. It must be an endogenous molecule. With this argument, what he did was he began to work with pig brain, and from pig brain, Four and a half kilograms of pig brain, he isolated half a milligram of a molecule, which now displaced in brain fractions, synaptosomal membrane fractions, displaced radio labeled tetrahydrocannabinol, which meant it, bind, it was binding to the same side. He then determined the structure and found arachidonyl ethanolamine, ethanolamide which he then called anandamide. Ananda, of course, is from Sanskrit. And he was asked then, why did you choose a word from Sanskrit instead of looking for a Hebrew name? Meshulam then said, you may well be aware Jews are not very happy. We have a lot of words for being down and so on, but not so many words for extreme joy, which means since you are neuroscientists, you must be interested in emotion. And if you are interested in emotion, you will be happy to know that our ancestors were probably much happier than the ancestors of the Jews. Arachidonic acid itself is there in membrane stores, and you can have release of arachidonic acid, which can then be used to build up anandamide. This slide is a digression, and I'm going to come back to this because Anandio mentioned 
that I had done some work with Professor K. S. Krishna, but then Professor K. S. Krishna had begun to do the work, which I will describe a little bit later. He wanted to do some experiments on fish. By this time, I was in the administration of the institute, and uh, I was at that time the chairman of an animal ethics committee. Uh, and in that committee, when this project was presented, one of the external members of the animal ethics committee asked, uh, do fish feel pain? Because you're going to inject fish with something, do fish feel pain? Of course, I had no answer to that question because I did not know anything about fish at that time. That possibly I had to ask uh, Professor Krishnan. He then produced the article that you see down below, which says that worms and crayfish feel no pain. And there's an article back in 19, this is 2005, the left bottom of the slide, you will see an article from 1979 from the New York Times which says worms can feel pain. And then, of course, in 2005, scientists say worms cannot feel pain. Then in 2019, which was long after I had retired, I found this article which says there is ample evidence to demonstrate that fish experience pain. So you can see that scientists also change their views over time. And I guess neuroscientists change their views probably a little bit more often than other people. The arachidonic acid related compounds, what we can now call glycosinoids or C20 molecules, they're very important in inflammation and in pain perception. And uh, if I show you this slide, arachidonic acid eventually goes to the prostaglandins, which are very important. And today, the entire class of anti inflammatory molecules, painkillers, as we might sometimes call them in popular parlance. All of them are inhibitors of the cyclooxygenase reaction. But the arachidonic acid chemistry is very important because when you look at it, you will find that somewhere along a molecule like stearic acid is taken. And from stearic acid, oleic acid is made. Even if you're not a chemist, you can see that the hydrocarbon chain is extremely unreactive. And suddenly, in the middle of the hydrocarbon chain, Two hydrogen atoms are removed to give you a double bond. I will just have a quotation here from Conrad Bloch, who won the Nobel Prize for his remarkable work on elucidating the biosynthesis of cholesterol. In 1969, Bloch reflected. He said, the stereospecific removal of hydrogen in the formation of oleate, although predicted on principle ground. In chemistry, we believe that enzymes can do magical things, but they can do so much and no more. And this probably is one of their limits. I showed you that slide only to emphasize one point that chemistry and biochemistry are in reflecting what would likely happen in the new century. And I used to read these articles, and Sidney Brenner wrote this in Trends in Biochemical Sciences in 2000. He says, I once made the remark that two things disappeared in 1990. One was communism, the other was biochemistry, and that only one of these should be allowed to come back. Of course, Brenner had not visited Kerala, I believe, and uh, although Brenner would be very much warmly welcomed now in Bengal, which was the other state in which communism flourished. But biochemistry, of course, has flourished even through all of this. And Brenner recognized this by saying, we do not have to resurrect biochemistry. It will flourish because it provides the only experimental basis for the causal understanding of biological mechanisms. This is important for students to recognize. The underlying chemistry, the underlying biochemistry, is what allows you to get a mechanistic understanding. Now I shall turn really to the only area where I can claim some sort of familiarity with areas which might border the neurosciences. But I make no claim 
to having entered these areas on my own. Professor K. S. Krishnan, who is pictured on the slide, was actually my first PhD student. Uh, when I joined uh, the Molecular Biophysics Unit in the end of December of 1973, I was less than 25 years old. I had no idea of what research meant and I had no idea what research could be done in India. The, one of the first persons I met was Professor Krishnan. He was not a professor then, he was a PhD student and he was actually looking for a PhD supervisor because D.N. Ramachandran had taken him into the department and of course he hadn't been assigned a proper supervisor. So on the first day that I met him, he was three years older than me. He looked at me and said, you are now my PhD guide. So I would really consider K.S. Krishnan as my mentor. And so while I was officially his mentor, informally, we were both amateurs trying to learn what we wanted to do in future. But sometime in the 1990s, many years later, when he was at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, now as a professor interested in neurobiology, he came into my laboratory one day. I was still in Bangalore and he came to my laboratory. He had a backpack and he opened the backpack and turned the contents of the backpack back up. He brought the. They look beautiful, but they don't smell that. Very good. Are able to attack every membrane receptor and channel in the neuro, uh, in the nervous in the central nervous system, and therefore or we should still look at the molecules. I asked him, what will you do if I'm going to look at the molecules? He said, I'll go back to the seashore and collect more shells and bring them back and give the snails to you. I'll keep the shells. And so he had this wonderful collection of shells. which stabilize prey, they paralyze prey, so they act at the neuromuscular juncture. Post translation and modification of biochemistry, you can summarize this say many, many peptides and many enzymes. Professor Oliveira at the University of Utah, who act and who really began this area of research today calls it conotoxinomics because it's very nice word to add the suffix omics uh, to any area of biological research. But generally what it means is this, that a very large number of the cone snail which will block potassium channels, sodium channels, calcium channels, uh, the NMDA receptor, uh, the GABA receptor, what have you, anything. Only one molecule has actually entered uh, pharmaceutical practice. That is the contraptide, which is used only for pain relief under extreme conditions because it has to actually be given by a spinal injection. But what we really see here is diversity. This diversity is the cone snail makes a molecules. This is because it wants to immobilize diverse prey. How does it do it? Because these molecules now bind to receptors on the prey and paralyze them. The receptor is already there, but the prey now doesn't want to be eaten by the snail. So over time the prey evolves and the predator evolves. So both receptors and toxins now evolve.
practice in ecology called the Red Queen Hypothesis, and that can be very well used here. It was introduced by this ecologist, uh, Van Halen, who introduced this hypothesis using a little story from Through the Looking Glass, Lewis Carroll's famous sequel to Alice in Wonderland. In this sequel, Alice beats the Red Queen, and both Alice and the Red Queen are on a checkerboard, a chessboard, black and white squares alternating. And on those squares, in some places, there are bishops, knights, rooks, and pawns. Alice sees this and she tells the Red Queen, let's play the game. So the Queen takes her and they both run around. After running around for some time, Alice, who's a very good student, makes an observation. for a long time, but we don't seem to have gone anywhere. We're still in the same place. The Red Queen, who's an outstanding professor, now gives the interpretation. He says, now here you see, that is the looking glass world, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. This is a rather profound statement, because sometimes in real life you run around a lot, but you remain in the same place. This often happens in research. What does this mean in the context of predator toxins and prey receptors? It means that they evolve over time. But it also tells us the same. So you can make new molecules by simply the atoms. You have enormous diversity, but the interactions between the molecules will still remain the same. They will evolve. And over evolutionary time scales, there will be this equilibrium where the predator and the prey then live reasonably comfortably in coexistence. Today, when we are in looking and viewing the pandemic, you will see that these sorts of ideas idea of pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, evolved. But I'll come back to my title. An insertion mutation. I've changed it to and behavior. This insertion mutation is uh, the orbit of the coronavirus as an insertion mutation. If you talk about chemicals and behavior, we can go back to classical work, the work of Andrew Charlie and Roger Gilliman, which gave us all the hormones, all the hypothalamic hormones. And the hypothalamic hormones were the ones, hypothalamus there at the base of the brain, now of course get signals from the brain, and then it makes molecules which it secretes. These molecules in turn act on the pituitary gland, which then secretes the pituitary hormones. So the hormones which we are very important, which come from the anterior lobe of the pituitary, are the adrenocorticotropic hormones. They are uh, GnRH, somatostatin. But from the posterior lobe are oxytocin and vasopressin. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. The story is very interesting here. The characterization of the very first molecule pyrotropin releasing hormone appeared in 1970. And in 1970, the techniques of chemistry were primitive. Mass spectrometry was in its primitive status. NMR spectroscopy was in its primitive status. Yet the pyrotropin releasing hormone structure of all peptides locked at both ends, pyroglutamic acid on the left, a post translational modification. C terminal amidation on the right, so modification, something that we recognize as a common feature of neuropeptides today, were first found there. You must also, for those of you who are students, you must realize the realities of scale, heroic experiments. They used 25 kilograms of sheep hypothalamus. You can imagine how much weight of a hypothalamus is. And from all of that, by all these painful procedures, they got one milligram of the material whose structure they needed to determine. But a few years later, the birth of neuropeptides, the encephalins were discovered. 
the enkephalins and the endorphins are endogenous ligands for the opioid receptor, much like anandamide is the endogenous ligand for the cannabinoid receptor. I've shown you the structures of the thionine enkephalin and morphine once again on the right bottom of the slide. On the left is just an image that I've picked up of a membrane receptor, one of the opioid receptors. Large receptors recognize these small molecules. There is almost no structural similarity between these molecules, although people have looked for it for a long time. Yet these have driven the field of neuropeptides. They were found again by the early techniques of fast atom bombardment flash spectrometry, which had just arrived, and the structure determinations are a famous episode in structure determination. Eventually, I come to the, the molecule with which I wanted to end this lecture, that is oxytocin. Oxytocin and vasopressin are hormones which are secreted by the pituitary gland, makes them, stores them in neurosecretory granules, and then in response to external stimuli, it now secretes them. The oxytocin and vasopressin have the structures that I show you here. I've gone to the conventional way of representing uh, peptide structures. I'm a peptide chemist, and I use the one-letter abbreviation. Uh, it's somewhat more comfortable than using the chemical structure. Now, oxytocin is made in, in our brains. It's a widely used molecule today in medical practice. It's used for induction of uterine contraction for pregnant women during labor. Oxytocin works on smooth muscle, induces smooth muscle contraction. Vasopressin is very important as a diuretic, and therefore these are two molecules which contain important physiological functions in the body. Snail, on the other hand, which I've been investigating, make molecules just like this. These are analogs which are called the conopressins. So one of our questions was, what the conopressins do the insulin to cause hypoglycemia in a prey. It also probably weaponizes our conopressin. That's not my subject here. I just want to show you a picture of Vincent Duvigno, who determined the chemical structure of oxytocin. Oxytocin is a historic molecule because it shows you the transition between the methods of organic chemistry and the methods of biochemistry. One year before Sandler reported the synthesis of insulin, Duvigno reported the first peptide hormone structure for which he quickly received the Nobel Prize. That was oxytocin and vasopressin. He then synthesized the molecule and showed that it had the hormonal activity of oxytocin. Why do I show you this today? This is because oxytocin is driving a new field of neuroscience. This is a cartoon which I picked up from the literature, Chemistry of Love, and there you have oxytocin. There you find the boy who's waiting as a suitor, girl is busy drawing the structure of oxytocin, the chemical structure of oxytocin on the board. What does oxytocin really do? This really is my last technical slide. And I've taken this from the very recent literature so that you can all read it. I've already given you a reference to the field of social neuroscience uh, in an earlier slide. This has a very provocative title, The Social Neuroscience of Music, Understanding Social Brain to Human Song. And it's just appeared in the American Psychologist. And these authors provide this remarkable illustration can imagine how difficult it is to prepare such illustrations. But I taught in a lecture that I gave the day of the National Brain Research Center, I must at least have something that shows you the brain, even though I'm not a neuroscientist. But what has been so far established is oxytocin is produced in the brain, oxytocin has dramatic effects on brain function, and that there are oxytocinogenetic pathways in the brain, the neurons which produce oxytocin now communicate with other centers of the brain. I will only tell you what these authors conclude, because I'm sure most of 
few will be able to read this better than I do. These are an abbreviation like PFC. I have to go back and read that it's the prefrontal cortex and then go somewhere else and see where is the prefrontal cortex in the brain. I don't really understand these things. What these authors really say here is this. They say, we conclude that the COVID-19 pandemic could be a starting point for an improved understanding of the relationship between music and the social brain. It will be the starting point for an understanding, I believe, of many things. Understanding a starting point of how we perceive poetry when we read it loudly and so on. In a time when people across the globe have been unable to meet in person, they have found a way to meet in the music. But long, long ago, in the 19th century, 1871, and this is quoted in this paper, because this paper really starts with a quotation from Stephen Pinker, in which he dismissed in many ways music. Uh, he just called it something like dessert on the real functions of the brain. Darwin, in the descent of man, had noted that oxytocin has become a very important molecule. In fact, it has become also a molecule of abuse. Uh, some a year or two ago, you will find that the Indian government had also worried about the how oxytocin should be sold in pharmacies. And sometimes when restrictions were put, the gynecologists and obstetricians are unable now to source oxytocin for women in labor. So it is important to realize, and that is really the point of my lecture, that there is a very strong connection between chemistry and biology, and that there is a very strong connection between chemistry, biochemistry, and neuroscience. In concluding this lecture, all I need to do is to pay a tribute and an acknowledgement to the two institutions which have sheltered me throughout much of my professional life. The Indian Institute of Science on the top left, and over four decades I worked there, and the National Center for Biological Sciences which has provided me a home in my retirement years. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. So, excellent. So now we'll have a question and answer session. Dr. Asaura Banerjee will moderate this session. He's collecting the questions, sir. Uh, um, Habani, uh, do you have some questions in the YouTube? Uh, no, unfortunately, okay. no questions in the YouTube. Okay. So, anybody has any question? You can give it to me. So, Professor Baram? Yes. Yeah. So, it's a, this is a very interesting question. Do plants have emotions since they have so many neurotransmitters? I can only say this that Yadish Chandra Bose always thought so, and uh, he always thought that plants responded to music. 
and he did some very, very interesting kinds of experiments. And I think one of the less well-recognized contributions of J.C. Bose is, are his contributions in plant physiology. He's so well-recognized for his contributions in physics, but it is much less appreciated that really how we define response. You can see that this the literature has great confusion even on whether fish feel pain. So changes with the decade. The absence of a centralized nervous system does, I suspect, does not mean very much. Next question. Yeah. So the next question is, how will changes in the stereochemistry of chemical compounds be able to keep up with the plasticity of the brain? I don't think you really need to change stereochemistry because nature's chemistry in some ways is limited. And uh, what you do really is only to change the sequences if they are peptides. And there's such a diversity of sequences that you and flexibility, you say plasticity in the brain, I use the same word on the other side, the plasticity of peptide structure is in therefore you can bring atoms into position by many, many different routes. So I would like to ask one question. Uh, so how do the brain optimize neurotransmitter for any single cognitive function? Well, this question I can't answer because I'm not a neuroscientist. I suspect this is a question that somebody in the audience should be able to answer. If it can be answered. I suspect there are a lot of questions in neuroscience which can't be answered. Correct. So, is there any other question? So there is two. There are two questions. Is pain subjective? That is the first question, and the second one is: Do painkillers have uniform effect in all humans? You know, I must say here also, I do not know. Like for example, I showed you the example. There are many people who are relatively insensitive to pain. In the example that I showed, it was a unique kind of genetic defect. But there have been other uh, examples. In fact, one of them is something that Professor Christian and I looked at many years ago. There was a Pakistani family where there was a genetic defect reported in which it was a defect, I think, in one of the potassium channels. And uh, the result of it is that the entire family was insensitive to pain. There are many ways in which pain and sensitivity might be there. All people don't feel pain to the same extent. This is uh, uh, levels of tolerance of pain are different. There are other ways in which pain is alleviated. You know, in the early days of neuropeptides, some remarkable stories emerged for the endorphins when they were discovered. Because it turns out that people have made of observations that in battlefield injuries, for instance, uh, wounded soldiers, they should feel incredible pain, but they're still able to not pass out. 
and this is largely because of the secretion of endogenous uh, endorphins which alleviate the pain so there are evolutionary mechanisms which enable us to deal with extreme pain uh, ch lee discovered at that time that camel endorphin was different from other endorphins and camels have an extraordinary insensitivity to what i would i don't know i wouldn't say pain but to physical discomfort which are imposed by human beings on them Is there any more questions, uh, Saurabh? So, yeah. yeah, another interesting question is, yes. why young PIs are not so interested to address questions in the areas of classical biochemistry? Okay. Yes. Except that I'm retired now, uh, I'm certainly interested in questions in classical biochemistry. I know lots of people who are interested in classical biochemistry. Unfortunately, all of them are old. Sometimes it is a generational change. You know, I wanted to put a slide, but I have so many slides that I couldn't find uh, it. I wanted to make it again. But Arthur Kornberg wrote an article in biochemistry in the late 1980s when molecular biology was actually flourishing, was reaching its peak. The molecular biology revolution following gene cloning was had actually swept everything. He said, he lamented in this essay that molecular biology, and I don't remember the quote exactly, in its tumultuous advance has swept away all the bridges to biochemistry. This really meant that uh, molecular biologists had forgotten much of classical uh, biochemistry and the utility of classical biochemistry. Today, molecular biology and biochemistry are integrated into one another. There's no biochemistry without molecular biology. But today, what has happened is own cell biology, driven by microscopy and imaging, dominates the field. If you look at it, you want but the result is we are into visual imaging and we are no longer working in certain kinds of as you are in the brain, then of course these are important. I think in the paper that I showed you in the last slide, uh, you do get a great deal of detail. And uh, I think it's just an evolution of subjects, that's all. Okay, so if there are no other questions, so Please join me. Thank you, Professor Bharadam, for his second very insightful uh, presentation. And so we have a very small we have a very small ceremony here. Uh, that it's a very tradition that in the on this Foundation Day lecture, we confer the Foundation Day medal to the speaker. And I would like to invite our director, Professor Prabhat Mandal to come to the stage. <clears throat> thank you, Saurabh. Uh, thank you, sir, again. 
and this is our i just want to say that i'm so happy and proud that i speaking before you so i was a student in isc bangalore and ssu and i visited your lab with orindam and i have so so i'm still remembering that time sir this is my honor actually so uh, this is a uh, sir uh, this would have been a great event if you would have physically that we generally give a medal to the distinguished uh, speaker and i will come to uh, isc and with a suitable time and uh, definitely personally and uh, this occasion will happen there just thank you sir this is we give a medal and this is the things we have been following for last many years with this uh, where is the camera okay <laughs> sir it is all everything is online so we just want to show that this is being <laughs> sir please share yes uh, yes uh, uh, dr all i could say is this that you can give me a medal virtually you can't <laughs> give me a cup of tea virtually <laughs> yes <laughs> that's very yes. sad yeah okay so okay so now goes back to um Anindo, Anindo, please continue. Yeah. So I would like to sincerely thank Professor Balram on behalf of NBRC for taking time out from his busy schedule and to deliver this lecture. And we are really enlightened by this lecture, sir. And also, it is time for me to thank NBRC administration, finance, the computer center, center academic section uh, for the support of the to support this event. Finally, I would like to thank all the students, uh, faculty members, all the honorable guests, uh, and everyone uh, to be part of this event. And I would like to conclude this event here. Thank you all. <laughs>